Welcome everyone. Um, so today I'm going to give you a talk um, about some of the, the new APIs or some of the new um, <coughs> methods of extending Drupal that are available now in Drupal 8. So um, really this is about, uh, it's a bit of a high level discussion, trying to look at, um, you know, why would you use one tool over another in Drupal? Um, so we're going to be looking at, um, it's, it's really a, a session that's targeted at people who are familiar with Drupal 7, so that means that you've written some custom modules in Drupal 7, um, you've probably implemented hooks, which is a very common way of writing, uh, what you typically need when you're implementing a module in Drupal 7, um, and we want to learn about best practices for Drupal 8. So, um, I'll try to keep it at a fairly high level, but um, there will be a lot of code examples in there where I sort of try to delve in and explain some of the concepts. Um, so just to illustrate some of the, the details there. <coughs> so we'll go through in, in this order. So we're going to be looking at hooks, um, a bit of a review of what they are and what, what goal they're trying to achieve. Um, then I'll, I'll look at plugins. Um, and then I'll delve into something that you might not be as familiar with, which is tagged services. Um, and then finally I'll look at, at, at events. So I'm Kim Pepper. I'm the co-founder and technical director at Previous Next, uh, based in Australia. We're uh, Australia's biggest Drupal shop down there. Um, these are my contact details. Feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I've been uh, a member of Drupal.org for about seven years and five months. I had, a, had to check before this session. Um, and I've worked as a, um, uh, on Drupal Core quite a bit. Um, with Larry a few years ago, we were doing a lot of the, the whiskey work, which is basically converting a lot of the, the kind of hook menu implementations over to Symphony controllers. And um, that's where I kind of cut my teeth in Drupal 8 and, and got to learn about some of those, those concepts. Um, so before we dive into the new APIs that are available in Drupal 8, um, we sort of have to go back in time a little bit just to look at you know, where, where hooks came from in the beginning, what, what goal are they trying to achieve? So, um, in the beginning there were hooks, um, they are actually around before Drupal 1.0, believe it or not. I had to go through the git log to find exactly where, um, where Dries had actually done the first commit and added the concept of hooks. Um, and it was pretty much like in the very beginning, so that's around 15 years ago. Um, so this is, a, this is the, the message that was in the commit that I found. Um, basically the idea is to be able to, to run, to decouple the um, implementation, the different implementation details from, um, from the code that's act actually executing at that time. Um, so we wanted to decouple in a, in a loose way. Um, and be able to execute that code. Right? Um, and this was a, a, a weird concept. I actually had a Java background before I got into Drupal. Sorry, just wait till everyone filters into the room. <laughs> there, there's a couple of spare um, chairs up on the end here. If you're looking for a chair. Cool, packed house. Woohoo! <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, this is the original goal of. Um, of, of hooks, and actually, it's it's an architecture that really defined the, the um, I think the the code base of Drupal, and what made it actually a very flexible framework to work with. Um, I think that's why it got a lot of adoption by developers, um, even in the days before, uh, you know, object-oriented PHP was around. This was a mechanism that kind of provided a bit more of an event-based mechanism for executing code in systems where. You could kind of decouple the, the, the listeners of the code from the, 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 uh, the event triggers, if you like. So just a, um, a brief explanation if you're not familiar. So essentially, um, <coughs> hooks are discovered in, the, in your dot .module file. Right? Um, Drupal will, in, in, in Drupal 7 and 8, and, and earlier versions of Drupal, look in the module file, or trying to find something that matches a pattern. So it's, it's based on a, um, a function naming convention. And the code that calls a hook basically says, if this function exists, then call it, right? Passing whatever data it might have. Um, and, and PHP is actually pretty efficient at doing that, kind of looking up 
if a function name exists. So it actually works. Um, there's different types of hooks. So um, there's a lot of, in Drupal 7, there's a lot of these things called info hooks. And really, it, all it's doing is um, providing like a declarative metadata about um, uh, what that bit of code is, how it is implementing and passing that back. Um, and hook block info is a really classic example of that. Um, a lot of this information is cached, of course, by Drupal, so it doesn't have to do it every time. Um, and of course, there's a, the concept of alter hooks. So this is really just a, uh, adding the ability to be able to modify, modify data. And the classic case is hook form alter, where you can modify a form before it gets rendered. Um, there are plenty of hooks still in Drupal 8. Um, I think um, the alter hooks are the kind of the most common case that you'll find in Drupal 8. Um, so, actually I had to ask Larry about this before I, I put this slide up, but basically um, there is a big move away from hooks in general in Drupal 8. So almost all of the info hooks are gone. Um, we replace this, those with other mechanisms, either YAML files or annotations, those kinds of things. Um, all the alter hooks are still there, most of them. <coughs> actually, I think there's actually a few more than there were before. Um, but there's a trend to move them and replace them with um, event listeners, which I'll go into in a bit later in the talk. Um, so <laughs> they will be replaced, but it, it, it's not Drupal 8. It might be Drupal 9, but who knows? It depends on the effort of whether people are interested in moving everything over to event listeners. So should you be defining your own hooks? Well, I'd argue not, because in the... Um, when hooks were invented, it was basically an version of PHP, um, which didn't have the concept of object-oriented programming. Um, and there's actually a lot of better ways to do it now. And if you're writing a new custom module and you're deciding on how you're going to allow other modules to extend that functionality, then um, you know, I would avoid hooks, personally. Um, so what is wrong with hooks? So, I mean, in this example, this is an example from Drupal 7. It's really hard to understand what it is that you actually need to implement, right? So, this is a very simple example. There's much more complicated examples than this. But, you know, if, you're, if you want to define a hook, how do you know what it is that you actually need to do? Um, only the top two actually required. The others are only if you have configuration with your, with your block. But using object oriented PHP, we can actually build very clear um, contracts or definitions of what it is they actually need to provide. So this is an example from Drupal 8. Um, and it's very clear exactly what you need to implement, right? So we need to implement a build method. If we've got a form, we need to implement um, block form and block submit. It really makes a clear definition about um, what's required. And because we, we can use inheritance, if you um, have some default implementations that everything can use, then you can just an extend from a base class and get all that stuff. You don't have to duplicate all of the code. So <coughs> procedural, I, I think, is, uh, has got a lot of negatives to it. First of all, all of those functions are, are global, right? So um, why is that bad? Well, it basically means you're tightly coupled to the code that you're executing. Um, there isn't a clear separation there. Um, and one of the key things, I think, is testability. So if you're using object-oriented code, what you can do is you can mock out the dependencies of that code and then um, test that code in isolation. Um, and if you're thinking about um, whether you need to have kind of end-to-end -end tests versus unit tests, I'd say probably 80, 90% of your tests in any particular project or code base that you're doing should be unit tests. Doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't have functional tests or end-to-end -end web tests, but you should be focusing the majority of your, your tests um, as unit tests. <sighs> okay, so the reason is because we can um, with object-oriented PHP, we can actually code to interfaces. We don't actually have to code to concrete classes or explicit implementations of class. Um, we can use patterns like dependency injection to 
to avoid understanding how our dependencies actually need to be created. They can just be passed into the constructor. And then we can actually do things like mock out those interfaces uh, when we're doing our unit tests. So this is, a, if you're not familiar with dependent, who, who knows what dependency injection is? A few people? All right, so it's a weird name, but it's actually a very simple concept. Um, and this is a, 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 a basic example of what dependency injection is. So you can see that um, in my class here, I, I want to I do something. Rather than understand what my dependency is or how it gets implemented, all I'm doing is just passing in the dependency in the constructor, setting it to this local um, property here. And then when I'm actually running my code, I just call the dependency. But you can see how I never, uh, never really need to know how my dependency is created. All I care about is that um, I've got an interface and I can expect that whatever methods are defined on that interface, I can call and whatever implementations there will be respecting that interface. So that's the concept of dependency injection. It's not too complicated, right? Um, the alternative would be if I were you know, trying to create, say, a database connection, um, I'd need to understand what its dependencies are. So its dependencies might be, okay, well, I need a connection object or I need all these credentials, all those kinds of things. You want to essentially abstract your, um, your code away from all of the underlying technical details of that dependency. And of course, this makes it easy to, to test, right? Because we've got a, uh, an interface here, we can provide a mock, we can test that that code gets executed, provide stub code to return data or whatever. Okay, so the rest of this talk really is about extending Drupal 8 with object-oriented programming. Right? So we're going to be focusing on some of those things that avoid this procedural code. So the first one is plugins. So plugins as a concept um, essentially existed in Drupal 7 with <coughs> CTools. Um, many modules took advantage of CTools plugins in Drupal 7. Um, essentially what they are is um, small pieces of code which you can kind of define an interface for and then you, um, multiple implementations of those can exist, either within your own module or other modules that might want to kind of um, provide an implementation as well. Um, plugins typically have configuration, so you can, um, each implementation can define its own kind of configuration that can, can be completely different types of configuration um, per plugin instance or plugin uh, implementation. And you, you'd see implementations um, providing sort of admin form support. Typically they would. If they've got configuration, typically they would expose that in an admin form to let you modify that and then export that as config. Um, and they also support the concept which is a little bit more advanced, which is a concept of um, derivatives, which is basically having multiple instances of, of a plugin, uh, a plugin kind. So, um, a good example of that in Drupal core is blocks, where you can kind of have um, multiple instances of a block placed around the site. All right, so how does Drupal 8 actually discover plugins? So this is a new concept in Drupal. We didn't have this before. Um, but it's actually what's called a, an annotation. Um, so we need the annotation. We also need to use the... the um, PSR4 namespace, the correct folder structure and namespacing class, um, namespacing um, declaration in our class. And um, it's got to typically implement an interface. There are, it's not strictly enforced, but it's best practice to ha actually have an interface for your, for your plugin, for all about the reasons that I explained before. So this is what, what an annotation looks like. It's very simple for blocks. Um, essentially, it's a comment that sits above your, your class declaration. Um, in the case of blocks, you can see here, um, we've got a special annotation called block. And then it's just a bunch of properties that define the metadata for this plugin. In this case, we only need a unique ID for the plugin, and then the label that we want it to appear in the admin screen uh, when, we're, um, when we're viewing all the blocks that are available. Uh, and then in terms of the PSR4 namespace, this is, very, this is a common standard across all PHP. It's not a Drupal specific thing. Um, but we can basically make sure that it has to live under the, the um, a plugin folder and the, um, the block 
folder and then with the namespace that actually matches that pattern. That's it, right? Drupal will then be able to discover that. It's different to how Drupal works with, with module code where basically we'll load the dot module file on um, every page load. Here it will, it will use PSR4 discovery to, to find that. So this is the full implementation of a block. So essentially you can see you've got our um, annotation at the top and here um, our custom block implementation is extending this block base. So we're taking advantage of um, inheritance here. We've got a, a base class which defines a lot of the kind of basic standard methods. Um, and the only thing that's still on the interface that hasn't been implemented is this build method, which just means that we need to return a render array. Right, so that's a, that's a simple example of a plugin Im implementation. Um, the other concept you need to be aware of is the idea of plugin managers. So this is essentially the, the entry point for, for, man, for dealing with plugins because um, essentially you don't know what plugins are available. Um, you would query the plugin manager to provide that information for you. And they're used for doing things like show me all the plugins that are available or create an instance um, or give me the definition of that plugin. Um, and a few of the other the concepts that you get with plugins, um, you're able to de do dependency injection, like I explained before, um, to, to pass in services. So, for example, if you've got your plugin needs to query the database, um, you can use um, uh, implement a method on there which will query the container, grab the database, and pass it to your, your plugin. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's other things like derivatives which allow you to create multiple instances of of a plugin. So that's just an example of how you would implement existing plugin types in Drupal. So Drupal Core provides a whole list of different plugin types. Um, so how do we define our own type? So you're building your own custom module. You've got to make a decision about um, how you're going to allow other people to extend code. You've been told by me that hooks are bad. Um, so how do you build your own plugin type? Um, so essentially, what, why, when, when would you build it? So um, you would do this when you've got typically, um, you know, configuration required for a number of different um, plugin implementations. So you want to allow users to provide configuration for them, or they need certain settings, um, and you might want to expose that as an, an admin form. So. And actually, to create your own plugin type, there is a fair amount of boilerplate that you need. Um, so first of all, you saw before with the block annotation, that's actually a class. So you need to create your own annotation class that defines the properties that you can configure with your annotation. You'll need to write a plugin interface um, that all of the plugins must implement. Um, and then, of course, you need to build in some of your plugin implementations. Typically. Um, you know, you might, imp you might implement a couple yourself that are, that are part of your module and then assume that other third-party modules will be able to add additional ones. And you also need to, to create a plugin manager. So the plugin manager is the thing that wires it all together. Um, so the plugin manager, it respons it's responsible for defining, um, say, the directory and the namespace, where the plugins live, where to look for them, um, what annotation class to use, um, what the interface is that you need to your plugin will need to in, um, implement. Um, and things like a plugin cache. So um, plugin cache basically keeps, keeps those things in cache so it doesn't have to do the lookup every time. Uh, and also what alter hooks are available. So a fair amount of stuff in a plugin manager. Um, and this is a very e simple example of a plugin manager. It's probably <coughs> the simplest one I could find, um, which is from the search module. And you can see here, essentially, um, this is all, I stripped out most of the comments just to fit it on the screen, but um, you can see like I, I need to be defining um, the namespace that it lives under, um, this, the, um, the search, uh, sorry, this is the search plugin, the interface that the plugin types must implement, and what annotation class to use. I'm setting the, the cache namespace here and what the alter hook is. So um, there's a fair amount in there. Um, but there's a lot of flexibility in the plugin system. So there's lots of areas where you can go in and override things and customize things how you might want to do that. And there's actually lots of good examples in Drupal Core of, of this being done. So 
um, things like how plugins actually get created. So that, that search plugin manager is just using the default creation method, but if you need to do additional functionality when your plugins get created, then you can customize that in your plugin manager. Um, how they're executed and also just things like listing what plugins are available. So there's way too many plugin types in core to list on the screen, but just to give you an idea, um, plugins as a, as a concept is one of those things that just got kind of spread throughout Drupal core, um, which I think is a good thing because there was actually lots of different ways of doing the same thing in Drupal, at, um, in Drupal 7, um, and we kind of consolidated on a single approach for a lot of this. Um, so you might be thinking, oh my god, like I need to, you know, create a plugin type is like, it's a lot of stuff there, like I need to learn all these concepts, like is there, a, is there a simpler way? And I think there is. I think if you don't need configuration, you know, for each instance type, you might be able to look at something like tag services, which is a very, which is a much simpler way um, of doing that. And I'll go and explain what services are and then what tag services are now. So, um, who's here familiar with Symphony and the Symphony container? Just a few people? Okay, so um, Drupal 8 adopted a lot of Symphony components and one of the, um, the most important ones was the dependency injection container. So, but before when I showed you an example of um, dependency injection where, you know, you just, all you're doing in your constructor is um, passing in the interface um, you don't know how it got created. Well, the dependency injection container is the thing that creates all of the instances for you. And it does that by looking at YAML files um, to work out what class to call, the cre or call new on. And you can do things like passing arguments. There's a whole bunch of options there. Um, so the benefit of that is that you, you essentially, uh, um, it's declarative information, you're passing, um, you just be able to do that in YAML, and you can just assume that all of the classes will be there in your code when it gets called. Um, and in your own custom module, you just define a um, module name.services.yaml file, and Drupal will automatically load that up and um, add that to the, the list of um, services. So this is a simple example of defining a service. Um, we have a YAML file here, and essentially we just need this high-level services. Um, we've got my, my services. It, it's essentially your unique name. It, it should be, um, usually it would be prefixed with the name of your module just to avoid a, a, a name clash. Um, and then here we're just defining um, what the, the class is that um, is, the container is going to create. Uh, and we can also do things like pass in arguments. So here we're passing in the config factory, and this at symbol means it's basically another service that's been defined somewhere else. But this could easily be, say, the database connection or anything like that. So these will get passed in um, into, your, into your class. So you can, once you've defined these services, to get them is actually pretty straightforward. So as I said before, if you're defining a service, um, you can pass other services in, and they'll automatically be there. Um, if you want to, if you have to, if you're forced to use a procedural method, you can use this um, Drupal class here in Drupal 8 that basically will find the service by its unique name, and it will just return you the instance that's already been created. Right? Um, there's probably too much of this being used at the moment in in um, in Drupal 8 core, um, so I actually I see this as a bit of an anti-pattern for the reasons I explained before around. Um, the problems with procedural code, it's actually much harder to kind of mock these kinds of calls out in your code. So, um, so the benefits of services, essentially, we, we get a lot of benefit out of that pattern of dependency injection. Um, loose coupling, decouple from the implementation details, we're programming to interfaces, and we can allow our, um, our plugins or even our root controllers, our um, the, the, the Symphony root controllers that are in Drupal 8 as well, to actually be free of a bit of that domain logic. We can push that out into kind of well-defined services. So now you kind of understand the concept of services. So what are tag services? So tag services essentially um, um, a way of letting the container, the, Dru the Symphony container, take care of the work of discovering what implementations are available. 
So what you're doing in your, in your service definition, you're, you're giving it a, a, a tag and the container will go through and say, find everything that's tagged with this. And I'll take you through how this, this kind of works. Um, so the first thing is we need an interface for a service. Um, we're always using interfaces um, to just have that decoupling. Um, and a manager. So a manager is probably not always a good term, but it's essentially what is calling these services. So whatever your domain logic is, um, be it a manager or be it a, a repository or whatever it might be that you call it, it's essentially the thing that will get past all those services that can them. And then we need to add some tags to our service definitions. So this is a, a, just a simple example of an interface that I would create. Um, you can see I've got one, one method called applies. And the idea with that is that I want to build in some logic to be able to say, should this service be called or not? I mean, you don't have to do that. Um, for example, if you've got services that every single one of your services, you just want to be called all the time, then you don't need this. This just gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, and then just something that I've called do something, which is essentially the thing that's actually going to be called. Um, and then this is our manager class. So it, this is basically where the instances of those services will get added. So we've got two methods on here. One is add handler. And what this is doing, this is the, this is the method that gets called by the, the container to pass the service in. And all it's doing is collecting them. So every time the Symfony container finds something with that tag, it'll call this this add handler method and it will add to this list of services. So what you end up with is just the, that property is just a big long list of all of the things that, that um, have been, had those tags. And then the manager is really where the, the business logic takes place. So in my example here, all I'm doing is that when I want to invoke these <coughs> services, I loop through each of them, uh, I check if it applies or not, and then if it does, I'll just, I'll just call it. So this is obviously where you could customise whatever functionality that you want to happen. Be it, um, you know, you could call every single one, you don't need to check if things apply or not, or you could do things like, um, if it actually applies, then jump out at that point, don't call anything further down the list. Um, really depends on how you, you, you actually want to implement it. And so the last thing we need to do is um, add those tags. So this is, um, again, it's a Symfony container um, concept where essentially we've got um, two things. First of all, we're tagging our manager class as a service collector. Um, and I think Larry might be able to correct me. This is a, uh, actually a Drupal concept um, where essentially um, we build up some logic to um, to avoid kind of re reproducing like the same things. It's just to remove some of the boilerplate. Um, and this here is, the, we're telling it, this is the tag I want you to look for to collect all of those services. And then down here we've got another example of a service. And um, it's, it's something that we want to be collected by, by, this, by this manager. So we just have to give it the tag that we defined up here. And then it will get found by the container and passed in. Um, there's also the other concept of priority, which, um, which is supported by this service collector, which means you can, it will automatically rank them in order. So if you want something to occur higher up in the list, when it loops through those, those things, it will basically respect this priority order. So what are the benefits of tag services? Well, um, we're still defining interfaces. We're using clear service definitions. Um, and we're actually using a lot less boilerplate than plugins. Um, when you don't need configuration for each instance type, this could be a, a, a much simpler way, albeit it's much more to do with the container definition. Um, uh, and it provides, I think, a pretty simple way for third parties to extend. Um, so it doesn't have configuration support. If you, it doesn't support the concept of admin forms. And of course, we don't have things like derivatives or multi-instance support. So there's quite a few examples of um, tag services in Drupal core already. So if you're familiar with, um, did anyone ever struggle in Drupal 7 kind of dealing with breadcrumbs and what order things? Yeah, okay. 
So this kind of solves that problem. Um, so basically, it's got the concept of um, um, you've got a number of different um, breadcrumb builders. You might have one for taxonomies. You might have one for nodes. Um, and you can actually go and create your own breadcrumb builder to override certain kind of um, conditions and say, OK, when it's this kind of node or it's this taxonomy term, instead of the default behavior, I actually want to override that. And, and you can specify all the menu links that you want to be in your breadcrumb, and, and it will get, it'll get used. Um, there's also things like authentic authentication providers. All of the Twig extensions are actually tag services. Um, and then something that kind of came in right at the end before Drupal 8 was released was the idea of placeholder strategies, which um, if you heard Dries keynote this morning, he was talking about big pipe, um, was actually like a few different um, strategies that could be used. So one of them is um, big pipe, which is basically you know using placeholders and then filling in the slow bits later on. Um, but there's also other concepts like edge site includes, which is using a CDN to do that for you. Um, I think there's another JavaScript one as well. So that's all basically um, tag <coughs> services as well. So lastly, I want to talk about events. And this kind of ties it back into to, um, where I started, which is basically hooks. So um, it's, events are essentially the same concept as hooks. What, what happens is something gets triggered, and we want some code to be um, able to kind of um, listen in for those events when they get triggered, and then do some work. And we don't really know what they are. So we don't know what implementations exist. Um, and we're not, we, don't, we don't have a list of them, what we're calling. We just want to say, go and fire that event, and then whoever's listening can go and do what they want to do. Um, and it's using another Symphony 2 component, which is the event dispatcher component. Um, and it all kind of happens inside the container as well. So we can leverage the container that's, um, that we've already got in Drupal 8 to, to achieve some of this. Um, and it can be any, the, the actual thing that gets fired can be any callable, so PHP callable, so the method or whatnot, um, or even a service method. So there's support in Drupal 8 call for being able to just say, load this service and call that method on the service. All right, so what do we need in order to be able to, to set up and use a, a, an event? So um, first thing is an event class. And this is really a, a simple um, data object that will get passed around to the events, as they're, uh, so the event handlers, as they're, they're called. Um, this could be just something for them to, to read that information out of that event and then do whatever they need to do. Or in the case of alter hooks, like modify some of that data and then pass it back to the next one. Um, of course, we need some business logic, so maybe a manager or something to, to trigger the event. Um, and then each of the individual event subscribers to, to do the work. So it's a very simple example. I've got an, an event class. I need to extend this um, event class here. Um, and then I can pass whatever it is I want. So in my example, I'm just, I've just kind of got this abstract concept of data, but this might be actually something that's m actually more meaningful to the events that you're creating, um, and then something to actually be able to get the data back. Um, this would be a, an event manager. So this is essentially um, the thing that notifies the event implementations of, of, of something and says, OK, go and do your work. Um, and you can see all I need is this, I need the, the Symphony event dispatcher object, which I can inject using um, the container. And then all I need to do is say dispatch. And here I'm basically, I've got a unique name for the event that I'm dispatching. And then I'm passing in the event object with the data that I want to pass into it. Right? Very, very simple like, to trigger an event um, if you're using the event dispatcher. Um, and then in my event subscriber, um, I need two things. First thing, I need to actually um, define what events my subscriber is listening to. So up here, I've got this, um, I implement uh, this interface, event subscriber interface. And it has this method on it called get, get subscribed events. And then essentially, it's just returning this array here of, which is basically keyed by the unique event name. So that's on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, I'm telling it um, what method to call. And by default, it will call uh, a method with that name on the same class. But if I want to, if I want to call a service from the 
container, I can actually give it a service definition and it will go and call that service definition as well. Um, and the last thing I need to do is just using the container definition to wire it all together. So, um, um, first thing is the event manager, all it needs was to, to have that event dispatcher um, service passed into it to be able to call dispatch on and that is actually something that's already available in, um, in Drupal 8 core so that's, that's just, you just put that definition and it will get passed in. And then I'm defining my event subscriber um, and the only thing you need to know about this is that um, you just need to pass a tag to tell it that it's an event subscriber and then the Symfony container goes, okay, you're an event subscriber and it will look for the, that method that says get subscribed events and it will do all the wiring up for you. Right, everyone's still with me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so um, when do we want to use events? So you can see it's a very similar model to hooks in Drupal 7. Um, it's basically, you know, anywhere where Drupal's actually saying, um, you know, module invoke all or whatever it might be, it's just triggering an event and then it's using the mechanism, mechanism of a function name in order to define um, uh, how to be discovered and how to be registered to, to be called when that event happens. Um, you can use events for altering as well, like, um, much like Drupal Alter does, because we're passing that event around. Um, if we wanted to, we could modify the data in that, and that's our option to do hook, um, form alters or hook whatever alters that we want to do. Um, and it could be a good replacement for a lot of the Drupal hooks that are, are there. Um, and I guess one of the, the, the main reasons that you'd want to use events is that we get all the benefits of object-oriented PHP code. So um, we're writing to interfaces, we've got loosely coupled components. Um, it just means that we can write unit tests around our code um, and have um, you know, much better, more granular kind of code quality. All right, so summing up. Avoid hooks. <laughs> Um, they're procedural, they're hard to test. Um, if you want to um, create something that is like hooks where you, um, you want to something to be able to react to code or things that you're doing, then you can use events that will support that. If you need configuration for multiple instances and you need admin forms and you need you know, users to be able to add some settings, then plugins are your, probably your best option. However, if you don't need that and you want something really simple or simpler, with less boilerplate, then you can use tag services. And with that, are there any questions? Uh, events and tag services inside plugins. Yeah, uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, yeah, that's a, that, that would work. Because essentially your, um, your event handlers um, uh, have access, can have access to the container and they can do whatever they want. So you could, you could probably wire it up in a couple of different ways. Yeah. What is the ideal scenario to use all these three? Is it a good concrete example of using all these three because they're still confusing. One is a tag service, one is a service, one is a plugin. Yeah, so I think um, concrete examples, so um, a good example might be for, for search, for example, where you might have um, multiple implementations, so search API, right? Search API in Drupal 7 is a very popular module. You might have a solar module and you might have an elastic search module. Um, and each of them, they have different configuration. Yeah? You have different configuration options for each of those. Um, but in terms of like trying to decouple your code, um, you know, you, you probably just want to um, implement a plugin for each of those. Um, and I think the core core system is actually using plugins, search plugins, for that reason, um, because they're different different things. Um, they need configuration. An example of, of using tag services was breadcrumbs, which don't have any, you know, they don't have any configuration. And all it is is really is like a list of different implementations and whoever gets in first, that code gets run. You don't really care about 
there's nothing that's user-facing for those for people to actually configure. And then I think, ev lastly, events are the thing. It really is a replacement for hooks. So if you've got a, a, a situation where you think, oh, I need to implement a hook, it'd be like, OK, well, maybe an event's a better way of doing that in an object-oriented way. If we implement hooks, you'll be it, we get an error? No, no, hooks are still supported. So you can implement hooks if you like. Um, I would discourage them. I mean, you're going to have to imp you're going to have to implement hooks from core modules. So if you want to do a form alter, you still have to do a form alter. That's the only way of doing it at the moment. But I'm just talking about if you're building a custom module and you're wanting to extend, allowing um, other modules to extend your custom module, then you have a choice right, about how you implement that. So in future, in the code is standard. Whether it will be like if you are implementing hooks to say that it's recommended to implement plugin or. Look, I, don't, I mean, really, it depends on how much community support we get around the idea of using events versus hooks. I mean, it's a very ingrained, I mean, there's still thousands of hooks in Drupal. So it's just a case of like, okay, is this something that we think is worthwhile doing? And then it's doing the work to actually get, get that implemented. Yep. So uh, with this latest drop series, you know, we've been talking about progressive decoupling as such and, you know, decoupling the front end and the back end. Right? Uh, there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, you know, you could also create your custom services, your custom events, your custom plugins, uh, or custom your custom manager, things like that. What do you think is your recommendation if we had to do something like, uh, you know, enabling components which use, let's say, handlebars or Angular or something else, you know, within the theming system? Oh, I mean, that's a little bit out of the scope of what I'm talking about today, um, because that's really decoupling. Not at a PHP code level, it's decoupling at a system level, you know, like this system's talking to that web service and those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a difficult. At, at the theming layer, I guess, what are the hooks or events or, you know, what should we use if we have to customize the theming layer uh, as such? So in terms of customizing the theme layer, there's still a lot of hooks in there for, um, you know, hook pre-process. -process. Yeah. That's all, that that's, hasn't changed. So. I don't think you can actually use events in the theming layer if you want yeah. to do things like modify variables before they get passed to twig templates. You still have to use the hooks. Sure, and plugins obviously with blocks and things like that. Yeah, you have to use, if you want to write a block, yeah. you have to write a plugin implementation. Sure, so, yeah. thank you. Excuse yep. I have a question like uh, you were talking about the handling the breadcrumbs. Handling the, sorry? Breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs, yeah. So I created that as a service. Can you set as a multiple plugins? Like suppose like uh, I created that as a blog, the breadcrumbs. It's changing uh, yeah. each type. So there's a couple of different concepts there. Yeah. So there's um, so the breadcrumb how to work out work out what the links are going to be yeah. in the breadcrumb, yeah. that's a tag service. Okay. The block that gets placed on the, the, the breadcrumb, that's a block, which is a plugin. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I want to add it just in the plugin in a block, separate, separate, so we can add it. You do it as a block plugin. Yeah. yeah. So we can add it and keep it in a separate content types. You should automatically click out. Yeah. It work? Yeah. Okay. Like you want to basically write your own. Yeah, I have like service? two cut three kind of dives. So it has to be come like this. So I defined that as a service. Like uh, this URL has to be this breadcrumb has to become like this. That is service. Yeah, that, that, that comes in a block. That's, a, but so the, that's what the breadcrumb. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the so, plugin. And then you would, the, that would just come with the normal breadcrumb yeah. block. So yeah, I can, I can add that plugins anywhere multiple times, right? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yep. Thanks. You can have multiple instances of that. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Do you have a microphone? Sorry, I can't hear. How to do a alter, core alter, core kinds of alter in with events, like farm alter, those kinds of uh, alter. Well, I mean that's. <laughs> That's not supported, so changing like hook form alter is not something that would need to be supported in Drupal core. What, what I'm referring to is right, if you're writing your own um, custom module and you're not just implementing a core hook, you want to basically use the concept of hooks in your module for other modules to extend your module, then you would use events. 
rather than hooks. You still need to implement some of the hooks that are in Drupal core. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think we're probably out of time. Um, yep, yeah, one more, yep. What is the role of annotation class in your own language? What is the role of the annotation class? So the annotation class essentially, um, the annotation class is the metadata for your plugin. So it allows um, each plugin type can define the, the kinds of things that you can set. In the case of blocks, it's really just the unique block ID and the label that gets appears in the um, in the admin screen. But there's much bigger examples like the entities system. It, it defines all the controllers and all of those kinds of things. There's a big long list of those. Um, and then what happens is the plugin manager essentially, um, when it discovers those, um, when it discovers the plugins, reads those annotations then stores that metadata with each of the plugin implementations so that you can do things like query that and, and work out what to do. Okay, thank you. And uh, what is the uh, use of build method in uh, block-based class actually? Build method. What is the build method for? Yes, block-based. So, suppose we are creating a blo custom block. Yeah. So, so uh, in plugin folder there is a block, in plugin folder there is a block folder and uh, <coughs> There is a block module name block.php file. Okay, so if we are going to create a, our own block, then uh, we have to uh, create a class and uh, we have to extend the block based class into our own class. So uh, there is a method build and access block. So what is the role of build and access block method? So build is essentially um, the equivalent of like hook block view in Drupal 7. So it just returns a render array, and which is exactly what you had in Drupal 7. It's just that now it's on an interface instead of just a method with a magical name. And the same with access. So that's just um, it's just equivalent to the Drupal 7 version. Uh, can we use uh, services in uh, our custom form? Yes. And how to uh, create our own event in custom form? Um, well, I can sh I'll, sh I'll share the slides. It's got some examples later on. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, um, yeah. If you want to rate the session, that's the, the link. Thank you. <laughs> Didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> 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 